Don Edward, it is great to see you. Same. Thanks for having me. Okay, so you were born in New York, Long Island, in fact. I read somewhere, John, that as a kid, your favorite TV show was, in fact, I Dream of Jeannie. Is that right? That is very true. Matter of fact, in my office, um, I have two, actually have three Jeannie bottles. And they're the real Jeannie bottles, are they? Oh, no, they are the real Jeannie bottles because I, I met a gentleman. His name is Mario Della Casa. Yes. And he won something called geniebottles.com. And not only do I have them, but I actually send them out as gifts because when people receive them, it takes them immediately back to a place of nostalgia. And they're like, oh my God. And it's like, it becomes like a showpiece in their room or the house or. I'm wondering, John, does Barbara Eden know that her show, I Dream of Jeannie, captivated you? I mean, maybe not just for the usual reasons, but the fact that it was a show that, for you, fascinated by virtue of the power and the magic and, and the supernatural and being able to move things and that incredible energy. I mean, let's not, let's, I mean, the, a baseline of the, of the appreciation of Barbara Eden, clearly, but on top of that, no, I was obsessed. I was obsessed with anything that had powers. So I Dream of Genie, Bewitched a little bit, um, yes. loved the $6 million man, loved the bionic woman, loved anything that Justice League, Superman, like anything that had powers I was drawn towards. Is Ghost one of your favorite movies, I'm wondering? Ghost is my favorite movie. Ghost uh -huh. is my favorite. It is the, um, I think, quintessential, has every aspect of the subject matter in there. Clearly cliche, screenplay, written, you know, it's got, it's got catalytic moments, but it's a great conversation starter. And it talks about the, the true connection, which is at the end of the movie, where no longer do you need the medium in Whoopi Goldberg and Oda Mae Brown, where Sam talks directly to Molly. And it doesn't matter how many times I've seen the movie, like I get choked up whenever I see that, because to me, it's the essence of what I want people to get from what I do. You don't need the medium. You just need to be able to recognize that there's something else. Now, I read your mother was very much into psychics and mediums. Conversely, your father was not the remotest bit interested. That it was spot on accurate, my friend. That, <laughs> I used to refer to my mother as a psychic junkie. Yes. Uh, and my dad was the person who said, make sure that my son is not around any of that stuff when you guys are doing it, which they did. Like, I legitimately wasn't allowed to be around any of their card readers or seances or whatever it was that they were doing. And then my mom and dad divorced. And when we moved, we moved into my grandma's house. And my grandmother's house was where all of this happened. That must have been like almost a psychic Disneyland for you to have your mum that was very believing and understanding and on that same vibe. And all of a sudden for you to begin to find your, uh, your psychic way. Yeah, I was more like my dad. I used to, um, although I wasn't really close to him, I had definitely been influenced by his innuendo and the sarcasm, like, hmm. that's not real. You know, that's uh, escapism. Your mother and her grandmother, you know, your, her mom, like, like you know, all of the derogatory innuendo planted seeds for me. And um, I don't know, I just found it fun to make fun of the people that came also like I was worse than my father to be honest like he would you know he would just shrug it off I took it on like when people got read at my grandmother's house when they would walk out of the room yeah. I'd be like what did they say and then as they were telling me what the reading was like I would start pulling it apart and I would be like hmm you know or when they had this one guy come to do he was doing card readings and everybody that walked out of the back room um, I'd be like, wait, you're going to Florida. And they were like, yes, he said, we're going to Florida. I'm like, of course you're going to Florida. You live in New York. Where do New Yorkers go? They go to Florida or they go to Aruba, right? So like <laughs> my, my, my approach was that. But I was 15. I was like, you know, I was a sophomore in high school. So it, it was only when they had one woman come who she did a reading for me where my life changed. She literally changed my life. She was so specific and so accurate that I couldn't do it with her with the other people and then I couldn't do it when I went and she was the one who put me on my path and told me I had this building 
I remember being on a TV panel with you, John, in Australia, and uh, you told this incredible story about how as a youngster, there was a wolf in your life. And uh, I think was it that same psychic was another one that said, there is a wolf there with you, you had no comprehension of what this meant. But it turned out that the wolf was in fact your spirit animal. Yeah, so my entire childhood, I had been plagued by night terrors. Um, and I would have really, really, really bad dreams, like really, really bad, vividly bad dreams. So sometimes I would have a hard time differentiating between my dream and waking up from the dream. And there were a couple of times where I would have dreams that I woke up inside the dream, but I was still dreaming. Yes. So it was a little bit of that that was going on. And then there was the wolf and the wolf would be like usually in the corner, left hand corner of my room. And it would just sit there, nothing, no growling, no, nothing else. But my dad was a cop and I would literally yell out for my mom. And it's so funny, I never yelled out for my dad, but I would yell out for my mom to ask my dad to come into his room, into my room with the gun, because he was a cop, because yeah. there was a wolf in my room. And they, they believed wholeheartedly, it was my secret approach to get in their bed. Like, I don't want to sleep in my own room. Like, I wanted to get in their bed. And I, I remember as a kid being really frustrated, like, no, I don't want to get in your bed. Like, I like my room. I, I want to be in my room, but I just don't want the wolf in my room. So can somebody come like, you know, and I remember my mom saying to me, you know, go to bed. There's no wolves in, in the city. You're not, we lived in Queens at the time. There's no wolves in the city. And, um, you know, we live in the second floor of an apartment. Like all the logic. And meanwhile, I'm hearing her come, coming down the hallway while I'm looking at it. And I'm like, okay, to the point that when I was in elementary school, we got called into school because they wanted to know if I was okay, because I had mm -hmm. bags under my eyes, you know, before I had bags under my eyes. I had like legitimately from non-sleep because I was afraid to go to bed at night. Though you had that healthy cynicism, John, were you still able to hear voices? Did you have these auras? Did you see things that you knew just stepped you apart from maybe other people at school? So I think the interest was like part one, the massive daydreams that I like wound up having in school. Like they could not sit me next to a window. Like if they put me next to a window, you might as well put me in the hallway because I just was like, off I went. So I would go into these deep meditative places. I mean, I could look back now and I would, they would call it a daydream and he wasn't paying attention. I would say, no, I was meditating. Like I was being pulled off into other, other places. Mm -hmm. I never had a cynicism. I had a very healthy skepticism, mm -hmm. which I want people to definitely have. But when I look back and reflect back on moments, yeah, I definitely had stuff, but it wasn't, I didn't think I was different. It wasn't until I had the reading. And when I had the reading, that reading put me into a position to study the subject matter. That's when I was like, wait, this isn't psychic, wait. Is it psychic? No. I'm doing Your psychic. original career calling was um, as a health worker, and it seems that you really did kind of have this pull toward healing people. Is that how you describe it? There was just this innate sense that you did want to be a healer. I'm going to say I have what's called teaching and healing energy. So if I look back to my first job working at a deli, I wound up bringing in other friends, and then I trained them at the deli. When that deli was sold, I was, I had always been invited by the owner of, of a video store in the same shop, and they would say, you know, come work for me, come work for me. And I'm like, I can't, I really like what I'm doing here. When the deli got sold, I wound up working at the video store. I did the same thing there. I learned the video store and then I wound up hiring people and I wound up training people there. So no matter where I went, when I worked at a laboratory, I wound up training people there. So I feel like I have this innate ability to teach like, I know I can teach, like I'm a teacher. Like if I understand something, I can find a way to convey it. Mm -hmm. I met my wife through ballroom dancing. I wound up getting involved with ballroom dancing. I wound up helping people teach there. So energetically, I know how to teach. Um, so that's part of my kind of access of who I am. The other side of that access is healing. So if I'm doing a reading for somebody and I go, you have teaching healing energy, I know that this person is either going to be working in healthcare and education. Because it's one of those two things that they'll do. Another lovely word that was part of your um, uh, early vacation was um, uh, phlebotomist. 
which is to do with blood, uh, yep. taking samples of blood and things. Um, and that too is a fascinating little cul-de-sac in your in your early working life, isn't it? It was a cornerstone of something because I I I was in university in a master's program. I was in an accelerated program for healthcare and public administration. So that was like condensing like two different degrees into one. It was a pretty uh, accelerated program. And I felt, because I was living at home, I should go get a job in a hospital. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll have an advantage because I'll meet people and make relationships and I'll know like folks in the hospital. And I wound up working as a phlebotomist at a local hospital. Then I loved the clinical side of it. And that sent me into like a, a little bit of a panic because I was like, oh, I like the patient care. Like, maybe I don't want to be administrative. Maybe I want to stay patient care. So then while working on the master's program, still doing all the psychic stuff because like I had to, um, but like while working in the master's program, while working at the hospital, like four days a week, I now started talking to PAs, physician's assistants. And I'm like, I don't think I want to go to med school. Maybe I'll be a PA. Maybe I'll be a surgical PA. I was like, I can get my hands into other different clinical areas. So I was doing all of that. And then my mom got sick. And when my mom got sick, um, I wound up having to drop out of the accelerated program to get the master's, graduated with my bachelor's, and she wound up passing. And then I felt like, okay, well, now life's happening. So now I have to become the adult. Like I have to, you know, figure out my career. I was 75% in the admin side of things. Let me move in that direction. And that's what I did. So I left the laboratory, wound up working in another section of, of the hospital, hated it. It was the buying materials management buying section. Um, I was there for like six months. And then I wound up working in IT. I was working in their IT department. And I, rem I literally remember sitting there going, I don't think I could do this for the rest of my life. Like, I don't think I could be like sitting here because coming from being a phlebotomist where I was all over the hospital, like it just like you started at 6 a.m. You were done at 2 p.m. But it was like, hmm, like the day just went. Yes. And interactive and people and patients. And even though I was sticking people with needles, I knew I was helping them. I know it sounds strange. And when and I would explain to them, I'd be like, listen, I know this is going to be painful, but you want me to do this. <laughs> and they would be like, I do. And I was like, yeah, because I'm really good at it. I go, I'm going to be in, I'm going to be out, I'm going to help you. And I said, it's not going to take me four times where I knew it would to take some other people, maybe two, three times. I was going to get those hard sticks. So I loved it. I loved the patient interaction. I loved all of that. But um, I wound up in, in admin. Then my worlds collided. Craig, somebody that I had, somebody I had read for um, saw me in the hospital in an administrative sense and literally did the like, like it was like a week after I read them. Um, and we had this like moment in the hallway where I was like, and they went, do you work here? And I was like, I couldn't say no. And I was like, I do. I said, can, can, can we keep this kind of like quiet? Because nobody, nobody here <laughs> knows that part of my life. That's right. That was your side hustle, wasn't it? That was like my, I, I wouldn't even call, well, can, by today's standards, we can call it a side hustle. By those standards, it was, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Yes. So I, have to find, I have to find out where, where I can do it, you know, while I'm working while I'm doing this, while I'm doing that, while I'm doing, like, I was like putting it in all the, so much so that my wife said to me, you're killing yourself doing like all these different things. Like, why don't you just do your readings? I remember thinking like, are you crazy? Like, I am, no. Like, that, that's something that I do because I have to. I don't always want to, to be honest. I'm like, now if I only did that at my job, if, if that was my job, then I have to. Um, I was like, yeah, it's never gonna happen. Then my worlds collided. And then I got called into, I say I got called into the principal's office, but I got called into the vice president of my department's office. And long story short, I was due for a, a promotion and a bonus and all this other stuff. And that's what I'm waiting for. Like, this is the, this is the, this is the meeting where you did such a good job and thank you so mm -hmm. much and all of that. And that's not what he said. Uh, what he said was, what's this dead people thing? And I just was like, Oh my God. Like the two worlds literally collided. Yes. It was like 3.30 in the afternoon. I remember that. And his name was Marty. I'm like, Marty, I could either sit here and explain to you. I go, or I can come back at 5.30 and demonstrate. And he looked at me with this look of like, oh, 
by all means, please come back at 5.30 and demonstrate. Yes. So I did. I, li I literally went back to my desk and I was like, I don't care who you guys got to get up there. I go, but you get somebody in his family to show up at 5.30. Please, please, <laughs> please, please, please. And I went and I read for him. And I remember about halfway through, I was halfway through the reading, proceeded the reading, and he wasn't looking at me. He was like looking straight ahead. And he just went to this place of, you're going to have to leave. And I said, leave, like right now, leave, like give you some time or like leave, go pack up my desk, don't come in tomorrow. And he just looked at me, he goes, no, no, like, no, like for me, leave. He goes, you eradicated 45 years of a belief system in less than 20 minutes. And then the next day I showed up, like I had to be there at like 8.30. I was like there at like 7.45, 8 o'clock. And um, he came in early and he stopped by my office and he, the way I had my office set up was like, it was like a wall like this. So the, yes. my office door was behind me. So I had a mirror that I put there so that I could just look over to the right and see who was like walking past. And I looked at him in the mirror and he said, why are you here? And I said, because it's my job and this is my career. And he smiled and he goes, why are you here? And that was the beginning of the end of me leaving. You said that your mother passed. Uh, and I think that you were kind of young, like about 19 or so when that happened. Exactly. Are you in touch with her, John? Do you find that she's kind of almost like an angel on your shoulder, giving you advice, championing what you do? So I'm going to use the example of like Vivid Sydney for folks that are watching this. If you understand the concept of how you get moved from one lighting thing to another, for the most part, your life would be Barangaroo, Circular Key, Botanical Gardens, right? You, you get, that's your life. And you're walking around your life every single day. Things are happening. You've got boats and you've got people and you've got life and all of these things happening. Vivid Sydney would be like messages from spirit where all of a sudden there's something that's illuminated in the moment that you look at and pay attention. All of a sudden there's a song that gets played and you feel that energy. And you know that that overlay to your regular everyday existence seems a little bit different, a little bit more fantastic, a little bit more wow. And I pay attention to those vivid moments that take place in my life. But your mother has come in. You've, oh, you've had oh, lots of conversations with her. Lots of connections. Mm -hmm. Conversations are different with a medium with their family than it is with a stranger. I can have a complete objective relationship with somebody who's passed when it's a stranger right there's an exchange that's happening back and forth when it's your own family then you have to discern the difference between what i'm thinking what i know what i'm feeling what i'm getting a little different is she proud of what's become of you and and how you tapped into that gift and have been able to teach so many other people all around the world what this is all about i have to say yes to that because she was proud before it even started um, you know, I remember being it's so funny, I, Craig, I just told the story not too long ago. I was about 12 years old and she every now and again would give me like a, like a, a fun day in Manhattan, mm -hmm. fun day in New York city where I would go in and I would like get a chance to like go to work with her. And the excitement for me was she had in a different office, an Apple Macintosh computer, and they all came with space invaders. <laughs> so I got a chance to play the computer version of Space Invaders. Uh, you know, that was my whole day. Yeah. And one day before I can get into the room, because it was being used, I was sitting in the, she was like in a, out in this open area and people coming in and out. And somebody like came in and like looked at me on the couch, like, who's the kid? And my mother was like, oh, that's my son. Remember his face. He's going to be famous. Now, as a 12 year old, do you know how obnoxious that sounds? Of course. Like, I was like, what? Like it was the first time I had ever ever heard her say that and i don't know why she did or where it came from and then subsequently after i told her like don't ever say that again um i had started doing readings and i was probably about 16 and i remember exactly where we were on the road and we stopped at a light and she said i think this is it and i go you think what's it she goes what you're doing what you're embarking on like what you're doing she said i think this is why people are going to know you and I just remember thinking, like, what is wrong with you? Like, why are you like, what, what is that? You know, so, but she definitely had those two moments, I think, back. So I have no doubt that she is very, very much aware.
1998, I know, is a date that will be uh, firmly in your mind because you wrote a book that became a bestseller one last time, kind of your story up until then and stories of connecting with those on the other side. And then the Larry King show comes along, you appear there and the switchboard literally blows up yep. with people just, I suppose, completely gobsmacked by what you do and how you do it. Yeah, because it was live. That that's a live show, so it was a pretty powerful, uh, pretty powerful evening. What did you take from that, John? That that appearance that I suppose was one of your first on television, where you were able to demonstrate this amazing gift you have. The reaction was so huge. What was your takeaway from that? You know, Craig. What's really interesting is that my entire career has always been based on one phrase. And it is, you're only as good as your last reading. Mm -hmm. So I've never taken myself so seriously. I've taken the work very seriously. I've taken the responsibility of it extremely seriously. I've taken <clears throat> the opportunities that I've had very seriously, but I've never taken myself very seriously because I feel like I really am only as good as my last. And if anybody believes the hype of who they are, or what they do, then I think they, I think they stop learning. I think they stop thinking that they have to be better because they think they're it now. I still want to be better than I than I am. And that's why when people say like, would you want to see crossing over on in reruns? I'm like, no. And they're like, really? I'm like, no. And they were like, why? I go, one by today's standards, God knows I'd probably be canceled because who knows what came out of my mouth back then that yeah. was so socially acceptable that I might have you know, I might have said that would have been by today's standards, like, you know, oh, we're going to cancel him now because 20 years ago, he used a reference that was something of that period of time. But beyond that, I am way different today than I was then. Like then that was a 30 year old version of myself who was demonstrating and only allowed to demonstrate and talk about spirit communication. Whereas I was already 15 years professionally doing this work where tarot and numerology and psychometry were all things that I was well-versed in with an interest in astrology and past life regression, but I couldn't talk about any of that on crossing over. It was like, you can't, I couldn't use the word psychic in advertising. Really? Psychic was not allowed to be used. It was so many rules. It was definitely pioneered breakthrough moments. Like it was a lot of that, but a lot of frustration came with that. So I wouldn't want to see that version of me on TV now because it doesn't represent who I am and what I do. Like the level of teaching, the depth I can go, I think I would probably cringe over some watching some of the readings, <laughs> you know, to be like how long it took me maybe to get the information. So like anything else, the more you do something, the better you get at it, the deeper you can go. I also read somewhere, John, that with regard to crossing over, that you kind of were a nightmare TV host. And I mean that in this respect, that um, this was not a regular TV program. You didn't want all of that editing and the magic going on. You wanted those readings to be authentic as they played out almost as if in real time. Yep. So there was that integrity to it. Yeah, I was a nightmare to work with. Like anybody back then will absolutely tell you, you know, that I was the difficult, challenging, temperamental um, talent. And I really wasn't in the in the way that you would look at it from a, a, a talent standpoint. I mean, they would, but it wasn't like I was like, I only want green M&Ms in my dress. Like it wasn't, yeah. that kind of vibe. you know, to me, it was like they were trying to get me to like I had a producer once came up to me and say, you can't take the train into the city. And I'm like, why not? And they said, well, no, we have to have a driver come for you. I'm like, no, I don't want to be in a car for 90 minutes with some other person's energy every day. I want to be like on a train in my own energy with my headset on. And I'll do that as long as I possibly can. And they said, and when the show becomes a success, what are you going to do then? I'm like, I'll drive. And mm -hmm. that was like a complete, like, what do you mean you're going to drive? I'm like, I am not giving up who I am because of a show. And there's so, and I could see, by the way, I could see how people who have opportunities lose themselves because you have all these people that are like, they want to tell you how to dress. They want to tell you, you know, where to, how are you going to travel and all of that. So like, that was one part of it where I was like, no. Then I had somebody say to me that you're, you can't do anything else but the show. I'm like, what do you mean? I can't do anything else but the show. Show has to be your life. I'm like, can't be my life. 
And they were like, why? I said, because when the show goes away, and it will, then I won't know who I am. I go, so I'm not defining myself by the show. I'll do it. and I'll do it to the best of my abilities. But when it came to the like actual producing of the show, I had some rules. And my rules were they couldn't edit anything out of context, out of mm-hmm. timing, out of sequence. They could pull out um, like timing of things. Like it might have taken like 20 minutes for somebody to realize their dad's name was John. So like we had those moments where they would pull stuff up. And I remember having a conversation um, with one of the producers where they, I remembered one of the readings and they took out a whole section of it. And I said, I need to explain to you why you can't do that. And she said, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit the thread of the rest of the message. I go, I understand that. I go, but I read this woman, her mom comes through. Her mom talked about the grandkids, her sister's kids. Then the mom went back talking about something else. So for timing, they took out all the references to the sister's kids. I'm like, I need you to understand that girl goes home and tells her sister, oh my God, mommy came through. And mm-hmm. mommy talked about so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so in the communion or whatever it was that she talked about. Then the show airs and it's not in there. Mm-hmm. I go, I'm not okay with that. I go, so you guys need to figure out how you need to montage, put it in the credits, like how we have to, by today's standards, it would be social media. Like today's standards, it would be like no big deal because there's so many outlets that they would be, but we didn't have those. We didn't have social media. So there was no other place to put it. So I was difficult when it came to that, that aspect of it. Um, I wouldn't let them produce the show. Like they wanted to do ripped from the headlines. You know, so if somebody had like a tragedy, they want to bring that person in. All of the TV stuff that is just second nature to TV I was pretty much the opposition to that. Mm. You can't produce it. You can't, you can't produce this. Like you have to like post produce it. So it's kind of like first you see what you get and then you can see what you can produce from it. It's kind of like doing a kitchen thing, you know, like a cooking show. It's like somebody comes into the chef and says, I'm going to give you this, 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 and this, what can you make? And that's how they could have done the show based upon who came through. When you talk about crossing over, when you talk about going to the other side, where is that exactly? What does that mean? So I think about the internet as the example always, right? The internet is something that people can conceptually understand as a dimension that you can't go to with a physical body, but we can access it. We can connect with it. We can communicate through it. We can see each other. We can be a part of our our, our people's lives. And this is living people, right? You can follow somebody on social media. You can see what they're doing. I kind of feel like that's what it's like. It's this energetic dimension of consciousness that's overlaid with ours so they're participants in our lives they can see the real life reality shows that we are the non-produced ones um and energetically be a part of it having been to psychic johns and i have to say some some very accurate ones um my observation is people seem to be happy over on the other side wherever that energy might be you never kind of hear anybody screaming, oh, my God, get me out of here. I can't stand it. So what is it that makes people seem more serene in that kind of energy pool elsewhere on the other side, having crossed over? I think that when people cross, that we're in the light of God, consciousness, love, understanding, family, at a depth that's impossible for us to conceptualize mm-hmm. here. I think religion tries to do it, but they do a bad job at it. I'm not a fan of organized religion. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, religion tries to control people with money and fear. And I think faith is so important, but that's free. And I think that, you know, when you stand outside on a beautiful day and you let the sun hit you and you feel connected to the universe, that's to me as, as much God as it is saying a prayer or an affirmation. And I think it's multifaceted. I'm not anti-religious to the point that I would not raise my kids with a language. I do think it's important that within your family dynamic and structure that if somebody was raised um, in Judaism, that they raised their children in Judaism. It's teaching a language that that child may or may not adhere to. But I do think that it's got to be an open usage of the language. So my kids were born and raised Catholic. They're 
more spiritual than they are religious, but they understand the tenets of faith, belief, God. And I think it also serves as a, a, a place of questioning. No different than when you're sitting in history class and you're reading from a textbook and you're questioning the motivations of what people did back then. So it's like a, it's a framework of understanding humanity and what lessons can we learn from history? Yes. What lessons can we learn from church or religion? Um, and how do we blend that into our choices of empowerment? Your kids also, your two children also have that gift, don't they? They do. I think there's a genetic predisposition. Neither one of them are using it in the way that I do. Mm -hmm. um, and the analogy I use is that my wife is Portuguese and they speak Portuguese with their grandparents, but they don't speak Portuguese at school. So they speak energy with me. They don't speak energy in school. Um, my son's going to be a doctor. My daughter is an actress. Um, that's her career path. She's yes. probably going to do all of the above when it comes to anything in that field acting, writing, directing, producing, that's going to be her, that's her passion. She's a performer, but she, she actually, actually both of them know more about astrology than I do. So like they can look at somebody's astrological chart um, and they could read their chart. So I find it interesting that the one thing that I don't do is the one thing that they studied in a way framework wise. So it's kind of cool. I remember an interview with you um, discussing your daughter, Olivia, and the fact that she does have uh, this gift, this ability, this incredible intuition. And she was a little tot, as I recall the story, and she pointed to the television screen and said, I'm going to be doing that. And it, said, it did wind I, up happening. I, she said, why am I not there? And, of course, Better Things was a show that uh, she starred on among all sorts of things. So that happened, didn't it? That came true. It did happen. It was a Gap commercial. It was a kid's Gap commercial. And all the kids were, like, on the on the, on the uh outside kind of like moving around and one of the girls leans down into the camera angle shoots up one of the girls like leaned down and she did this thing so yeah. i looked at my daughter on the couch and she did the same thing back i laughed and then she went why am i not there and i go why are you not where and she pointed to the tv and she's like why am i not there and i was like you want to be there and i was like like you want to play with them and she was like no i want to be on that and i laughed i was like yeah okay and she wound up there it's quite extraordinary. Do you think everybody has the gift, John? Do you think uh, everybody has the ability uh, to figure that psychic energy or is it a gift only for a chosen few? I'm going to say that everybody has the ability. I am going to say that only a few, in my professional opinion, should be doing it for other people professionally. Mm -hmm. But the gift is the actual connection. I don't use the word gift. I think it's all about abilities. And I think the gift is the connection. So if I'm doing a reading for somebody or you're making a direct connection in a dream, that's the gift. Like to me, the gift is the connection. Um, too many people in the field, and this is just like the lexicon, the vernacular of what people are used to in the zeitgeist. And that is the word gift and psychic gifts kind of go hand in hand. So I've kind of tried to change that over the years, like try to say, the gift is the connection. We have an ability because mm -hmm. when you say, you know, my gift is I hear I'm more special than you because, and that creates a, a like a, a disconnect mm, an us and them mentality. Yeah. I don't like that. So I've been like this since I was a kid, you know, I'll be 54 in October. Like I'm still telling people, I don't think anybody needs me. <laughs> like, I don't think anybody needs a reading. I think that if we can understand that there's a survival of consciousness and we can understand that life and love are eternal, if we can recognize signs and symbols that happen around us, then we can build that bridge and be 50% of the equation and incorporate them in our own lives. Then if you go for a reading, it's not needed, it's wanted. And if you want one, that's different. If you want to participate, like you don't need ice cream, you need nutrients. So this is like ice cream. Like, mm -hmm. it's a nice thing to have. It's something that I think tastes good, but it shouldn't be what you eat. It shouldn't be what your quote unquote nutritional plan is, right? So mediumship is not a cure for grief in the same way ice cream is not a cure for hunger. So I feel like it's something that is positive, could be helpful, could be fun, could taste good, could, could, could really be positive for people if they're open to it from a, a want 
not a need. Who is easier to read, John, men or women? And really, why? Men are cerebral when it comes to the information. Women feel it more. Mm -hmm. So it it is, even though the majority of the audience is female, because more women are open to the subject matter, when it comes down to like, like for like doing a reading, um, men are going to go to the yes or no of it. It's either true or false. Women are going to go to the place of how does it make them feel at first. So sometimes I have to work a little bit harder because I'm very much cerebral when I read surgical. I'm, I'm, I'm precise in what I want to say. And that doesn't always can come across to people with what they want to hear. What about pets? Are you able to channel the energy of pets who've passed? Pets do come through. Um, I will tell you that early on, so I started in 1985. If I would have heard between 1985 and 1994, a, a dog bark, I would know that somebody had a pet in spirit, cat, mm -hmm. dog, bird, whatever you had. I would be like, oh, you lost a pet? And they'd go, yes, that was the extent of it. Then in 1994, I got my first dog. It was a Bichon named Jolie. Mm -hmm. When I got her, all of a sudden, my frame of reference opened up to the, to the world of unconditional love from these little fur babies. And um, then I started making connections with energy that were pets that had passed. Do you know if um, energy like that, um, somebody who's passed over, can be physical? I mean, I I've heard... Uh, certain Hollywood stars claim that they've had uh, intimate relations with ghosts. I myself have had for years a strange situation, John, where in the wee hours of the morning, I'd feel there's something coming up the stairs and into my bedroom and this incredible weight go on my body, especially on my chest, and feeling almost paralysed that I couldn't move, couldn't even, could barely breathe or lift my arms. Is that some kind of energy that is being physical or what in the heck could that be? Um, I can't really, I, I haven't had that experience. So I don't really have anything to draw from. Mm -hmm. I know that people will think places are haunted because there's energy. And I, I will say there's residual energy and built up energy in places. So if I blindfolded someone and I brought them into a nightclub and just said, tell me how you feel, they're going to feel the energy of that nightclub and they're going to describe it. Well, if you take a person to a place where um, things have happened, there's a built up residual. Like I've never, as a New Yorker, gone to the 9-11 monument. Mm -hmm. I've never gone down to that place. And the reason why I've never gone down to it is I don't want to feel the energy of what people bring there grief-wise. So when my son was like in fourth grade, and he was in fourth grade, I took him, I, I was in Hawaii working and I took him with me. And he said he had to write, it was right before Veterans Day in the States. And he said he had to write something about a veteran. I went, oh my God, I've got the greatest, I, this is perfect. And he goes, what? I go, we're going to go to Pearl Harbor. And he said, okay. I go, you want to write about a veteran? I go, this is the place to do it. And we did the whole Pearl Harbor experience, watched the films, went out on the boat, went to where the USS Arizona was in the ground and you could see the oil slick. And I got really sad and really depressed because of what took place there. But now we've got decades, years of people paying their tributes and memorial, this somber energy of all of the people coming collectively together for the same kind of memorial feeling. That was a heavy feeling for me. So there's residual energy in places that gets created. I think I would feel that if I had a private tour of the 9-11 monument or the USS Arizona, because all of that energy is there. Not the soldiers who passed, not the people who perished in in the in the in the towers that day and on those planes they're not trapped or stuck it's just regular people depositing that energy there so yeah i'm 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 there's there's that that you can be feeling are you scared of death john does that terrify you i think a little bit mm -hmm. i mean how i get there like that process i mean that's human i think you know we labor to come into the world we're going to labor to leave but um I'm not worried about an afterlife if there's something else. 
I look at it as one day I'll be reunited with a lot of people that I miss. It's interesting to hear a lot of people talk about their absolute dread fear of death and so forth. It's not something that concerns me in the slightest. It's just a fact of life, isn't it? We're here and then we're not in this particular form. But um, what would you say to people who do live their life in this panic and terror and feel of the inevitable that you move on to the next adventure? I would never want to discount their fear. I'd want to first validate that I understand why they feel that way. And it's usually because something had happened early in their life that death was not discussed and that a person passed or there was a reaction that they had, whether it be to a family member, a friend's family member, somebody in their circle reacted in a way that left an impression. They saw something, TV or movie, that left an impression. Um, and I, Or maybe there's a past life connection in some way that there's something that's residual from that. But I think first we'd have to honor what that is. But the reality is we do labor to come into this world and we do labor to leave. But on both sides of that labor, we're met by love and family. Your life has been a blur of TV appearances and radio shows and writing books and touring the world, um, linking the living with those that aren't in this world as we know it. In October through November, you are getting set to tour Australia, which i got a feeling, John, is probably one of your favourite places in the world. Would I be right? Be absolutely correct. <laughs> See? Incredible, isn't it? Yeah, I might well have that ability. There you go. No, it is. It, 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 is the, it is my favorite place to come. There is something very, very special and inherent that I noticed. And it took me, took me a few years of coming here, like when I first started to come here. Um, the first couple of tours that I did were like arena tours. That was overwhelming. So I, I, don't, I don't count those. I count the ones that came after. And the ones that came after were like my regular tours that I would do around the world. And I started to recognize this sense of, I didn't, I didn't want to do events in the States when I was done doing events here in, in Australia. And then I had to try to figure out why. Like, was it the time difference? Was I tired? And it really just boiled down to the energy of what I felt was so special here that I wanted to end my year with that. And I wanted to have my, I wanted that to stay. I wanted that to be my ending of my year and that it was a different, different vibe. I love my country. I love the opportunities that I, you know, have to, to, to live in America. But the last decade in the U.S., the division has only gone from like zero to a thousand. Mm. The divide is crazy. Um, but I started feeling this in 2003, 2004, 2005. Like, and I'd be like, what? Like, I kind of, what is that? Like, I don't want to be un-American, but like, we have the word united in our title. And yet here in Australia, time and time again, there were these moments of connectivity that were just really special. So for example, somebody tweeting me and saying, hey, we're sending an email to the office. Like, hey, not going to make it to any of your events, mate, but I know that you're in Melbourne tonight. I hope you help a lot of people and have a great time. Be sure to check out this. And I'm like, that happened a lot. And when it, it all boils down to like, you guys care. You care about like your country. You care about other people. You care about what's happening. I watched something. I don't know. There's a there's a a, a TikTok that I just saw last night about. Is it Gogglebox? Am yes. I saying that? Okay. Yes. You're right. So so you have all these people that are Australian in their homes. Yes. And they're watching somebody on TV. And there was a there was a woman who said next year at this time, I'm going to be a man. And it was this like jaw dropping reveal. Now, right now in the States, like you have places where they're passing don't say gay bills. Oh, it's shocking. Yep. Incredible. You have, like LGBTQI attacks on that community. It, it It's a little bit like, like 1950s is calling in the mm. States. Like what the F, right? So I'm watching this 
And then they show you a year later, the, the, the woman comes back. She's now transgender. She's a, a male. Mm -hmm. she's reintroduced to the audience of that show. Her family's in the audience. And clearly there was an issue with acceptance with dad. Dad's in the audience. Dad gets brought up and there's a whole conversation. I like both my eyes out last night watching this clip. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's what I mean. You know, that's what I mean. There's some level of community and culture and acceptance and humanity. And cohesion, that's right. But there's individualism in, in the States and here you actually have community. So to stand in front of that and feel that in the work that I do, to stand in front of that and feel that as a community, it's pretty powerful. Do you think there will be a healing? Will the United States once again be united in, in, in more ways than simply the name uh, okay. of that continent? Is, is there going to be that love found and respect for one another again at some point? I, ho I hope so. I've been, I, have, I have been the entirety of my life a non-political person. Like mm. the first time I ever voted was in 2020. Um, like I am so... I, there was a moment where I was doing a, on, so I host an online show called Evolve with John Edward on, on a platform called EvolvePlus.tv. Yes. And my co-host is my cousin and, and she's very historically aware and politically aware and smart. And we were having a conversation once about something and it had to do with the vice president. And I couldn't remember which vice president went with what president. And we, it was like live. And she just looked at me and just went, stop talking. Just, just <laughs> stop talking. Right. So. It was funny until it wasn't funny. And now I feel like I know what senators belong to what states. I know how they voted. I know like all of this stuff that I just don't really want to know. Like, I just don't want to have to know it. But right now it's like right in your face constantly. And I can't, you know, like I had a celebrity friend call me up and said, listen, I'm going to say this, like, you know, don't take this the wrong way. And I was like, go ahead. And he was like, you know, if you speak out politically, you're going to alienate like half of your audience. I'm like, if there are people that are banning books and are anti, you know, LGBTQIA and they can't understand trans people and they're like concerned about drag queens, I go, I don't want to read them. Mm. Bye, bye. See you later. Unfollow me. Like, I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> like, That's it. I'm, like, I'm that person. So. And then somebody said, well, doesn't that foster more division? I go, it might foster more division. I said, it might. I don't know. I go, but I can't deal with stupid. I really honestly can't deal with stupid. Like I just, it, it, it I, I have a, I have a thing. You can see I'm getting hot. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I think you and Judge Judy have got a very good point with that, John. Um, you have a dog named Sydney. I do. And I'm just wondering now, having um, rhapsodized about Australia and your various trips here and so forth, you happen to be in Sydney right this very moment, Sydney, Australia. I'm just wondering, is your dog Sydney an homage to the very city you're in now, or is it just simply a coincidence? Nope. She is specifically named after the city of Sydney, Australia. How fantastic is that? I'm, I'm getting the feeling too that at some point in time, maybe you already have, I, I don't know, but um, uh, buying a place in Australia that, that you and your wife, uh, that your kids can just come and enjoy just to kind of decompress and get away and enjoy your second home. I would move here in a New York heartbeat, literally in a New York minute. Matter of fact, I was missing, I was missing Australia so much during the pandemic. And coming here, two things happened. My wife and family went to, um, in Disneyland, they have a ride called Soar. Yes. And at a certain moment, you come through the clouds and you're over the opera house. You're literally over the opera house. And I actually got, I actually got emotional. I was like, oh, wow. And Sandra looked at me and she was like, you'll be back before you know it. I'm like, no. I said, it's going to be 2023 before I get back. And she goes, 2023? I was like, it's going to be 2023. It's going to be a while before I'm able to get back there. So like I knew, like I knew that it was going to take me a while. Uh, it is absolutely lovely having you in Australia. So just to recap, you are on tour right across the nation and the dates will be up on our screen from October through November. Um, are you going to make the um, your kind of 
the way in which you do uh, your readings different this time? Or what, what are you going to do? Is there some kind of other plan for your shows on this occasion? No, I, everything's pretty much the, the you know the same for me. It's what I, people I, love. Yeah, if I if I changed it up, the only time I thought about changing it was when I was in Tennessee. Um, when I was in in uh, in Tennessee, there was a whole like you know drag ban and whatever. And it was like the last minute when I saw the news, I was like, "Do we know any drag queens in Nashville?" And they was like, "What?" I go, "I'm gonna go do my readings in drag." And <laughs> she looked at me, and she was like, "She goes like, I would pay good money to see that." She goes, "I'd pay really, really good." Money. <laughs> Remember the headlines, you know, John ever gets arrested for reading and drag. Oh my gosh. You see, there you go. There is your ability to uh, look into the future and maybe that might be a headline. I got a feeling the national Enquirer would be quite excited by this po possibility, John. Could you imagine? Could you imagine? I was like, <laughs> now people can find your, uh, uh, all sorts of things about you on your website too, which is John Edward.net which I got to say is is quite the fabulous place to be for all things John Edward. Thank you. Thank you very very much. Can I just say it's been great fun chatting to you. Most illuminating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Kelly.